Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Art Gallery. Um, and welcome to this uh, uh, second of our what is now going to be called Student Seminar Series in the Library. Uh, I'm very happy uh, and excited to welcome our two young speakers, uh, Jansu and Nurten, who in a few minutes will be telling us about the BRICS nations, the rise of the peripheral power, specifically with reference to Africa. And is it a new scramble for Africa? I'm looking forward to hearing about this. I'll say a few words before we start uh, by way of uh, explanation for those of you who may not have come to our first student seminar uh, a few months ago. As you may know, we organize a, a series of lectures every semester by faculty members called the lunchtime lectures because they happen at lunchtime. Uh, and a, a young uh, student emailed us to say, I have a, an interesting topic. I would like to present my topic in the lunchtime lecture. And I was in the process of replying saying, but these are very special lectures for the professors. They're not really thought for students. Then I thought, that's not very nice. That's not very friendly to the students. Many students in Bill Kent have done their own uh, research in various ways and have got interesting ideas to present. Why don't we start a similar series where we will give a chance for different students to, to present their work. Uh, we have many courses in the university where people work often in groups of two or three and they have a special project which they then uh, present to their professors at the end. So particularly students from those projects can, can join us. In particular today, uh, Jansu and Nurtan uh, are, are presenting work they did as part of the transdisciplinary course that's run by the Economic and Social Science faculty, and I must thank Ali Bilgic for his help in sending them to us uh, for today. Um, so any of you who in the future, having listened to the ladies today, think, I would like to have a chance to present my work uh, to other people on campus and even to the YouTube, because we will be putting the video of this uh, on YouTube shortly, uh, and a chance to practice your presentation skills or whatever they might be, you can contact me or specifically Hande Uchaturk, the librarian standing over there, who is in charge of coordinating this project. And next year, we hope to see some of you not sitting there, but standing up here uh, and giving your presentations. Uh, some of you may have come uh, for what has been billed on stars as a music concert for uh, which in fact took place yesterday there was some confusion on stars uh, please speak to Hande at the end and she will make sure that you will get your GE 250 251 points uh, if that's the case okay I will shut up uh, and I will let the ladies take over they will do presentation we will have a chance for questions uh, afterwards, and they're also hoping to talk a little bit about the transdisciplinary course, because I think some people here are, are in get, in get, will be engaging upon that next year, and they're a little bit nervous. They want some feedback from the experienced ones who can tell them how it works. So you'll have a chance to discuss uh, and hear their thoughts about the course in general uh, at the end. If you have a class, uh, as I do at 1.40, Please feel free to leave, even if talking is still going on. Uh, we'll try and finish by as close to 1.30 as possible. But if you need to leave, uh, there's no problem. Okay, ladies? Buiran. That was a bit problematic. Firstly, thank you all the library staff. You've been more than helpful. Welcome. Today, my peer, John Sukarman, and I will, in, will present to you our research on the African agenda of the BRICS, uh, consisting of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and the Republic of South Africa. The research project is our senior project under GE445, Transdisciplinary Senior Project on Power and Development. And on this note, we would like to thank our group mates, Berk Birol from International Relations Department, Pelinok and Selim Bash from Economics Department for their valuable contributions to our project. And also we would like to thank our instructors, Ali Bilgic from International Relations, Başak Inca from Political Science and Mina Kara from Economics Department for their valuable guidance. Without them, we wouldn't be here to present you our research that was awarded first place in the GE seminar. Both Johnson and I are senior international relations students here at the Bilkent University. 
And after presenting our research, we would like to talk briefly about the GE4XX, a must course for political science, international relations, and economics students. We did refer to it as the bomb, an eerie bomb for all senior students. I'm sure you must have heard, about, heard the myths about the course. Some of you just submitted your first draft, and some are letting their future selves deal with it. Throughout the presentation, by presenting our research, we will tell you the tale of how we come to love the bomb. Up until now, you heard about this course from your instructors, and we hope to present you the perspectives of the survivors, and show you we've been there, done that, and got the scars. Leaving the jokes aside, transdisciplinary senior project contributes highly to the academic skills of the Birkent students, so try to make the most use of it. Well, I myself is a huge fan of spoilers. Don't we all love them? So take this as a spoiler alert, because I'm about to introduce you our thesis. When we set out to do our research, our thesis was that the African agenda of the BRICS, combined with the United Nations-led framework, can provide growth figures, yet it fails to provide an empowering agenda that constitutes sustainable African futures. Well, BRICS as a multilateral forum uh, was promising as this international group had high potential to reform the global governance structure, uh, to be multilateral, inclusive, and democratic. And in an environment with increasing need to reform the global governance structure, BRICS and their African agenda was worth exploring. We were hoping we would be wrong with our thesis. We tried not to join the dark side. We even denied their cookies. The initial question we had in our mind was the following. Can BRICS reform the current global governance structure that is inadequate in addressing the complex issues of the 21st century? And to unravel it, we explored the BRICS as a multilateral forum. What is development and the current development agenda led by the Western nations, the structure of the global governance, the discursive characteristics of the African development agenda of the BRICS, as well as their agenda at play through our case studies of Sudan and Nigeria to see the implications of all these on BRICS and global governance. All these seems like fancy words. Now Johnson will start guiding you on our quest to unravel all these concepts and join the dark side. Well, um, before I take you to the dark side, uh, I just want to say that the discourse of the BRICS and their engagement with Africa may seem quite convincing in terms of their efficiency uh, within the alternative global conduct, but unfortunately the reality actually presents us a different scenario. But first, let's, what, uh, let's start what BRICS is and what they account for. BRICS is an acronym first used by Jim O'Neill in 2001 uh, and his analysis published by the American investment and banking firm Goldman and Sachs. And these nations, namely Brazil, Russia, India and China, uh, transformed themselves into an actual look in 2006. And with the inclusion of uh, South Africa in 2010, this acronym took its last shape with an S. These uh, nations account for the 15% of the world economy and 42% of the uh, global currency. And the discourse of the BRICS on the global conduct that can be driven from their summit declarations is that they're not uh, emerging as a rival coalition, but they actually offer an alternative global conduct to the West. As you can uh, see from the slides, they address South-South engagement as rise of the rest. Uh, they refer various issues such as voting shares in the institutions of global economic governance such as IMF and World Bank. They also want participation in political institutions too. They refer various issues uh, and uh, these 21st century challenges listed here. And they think that the current uh, West-led development and this current agenda cannot address them adequately actually. And uh, what is repeatedly noticed from their summit declarations is that they demand multilateral institutions that do not paralyze the emerging powers while attaching West nations to the core. So they admit that the current uh, development framework is done by the West and they are the core nations. But the way that do this actually they, th they think is wrong. So they are not satisfied with the neoliberal framework of the West and there is something wrong with the current global governance they argued.
Well, we as the students of international relations and perhaps scholars tend to use the concept of global governance a lot. But there might be some among you that doesn't really know what it is. And even if you know it, since we tend to use it a lot, we tend to take it for granted. So let's just briefly talk about what it is. In a world order without any world government, a separate state above states regular global affairs, um, governing activities, reliance on a mode of governance is the main trend in world politics. This governance includes all governing activities at a global scale, varying from international institutions to international negotiations and treaties, as well as the norm creation process. It's mostly done through international uh, institutions such as the United Nations, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Trade Organization. It has its roots in late 1940s, the post-Second World War process, and mainly in Bretton Woods Conference that established global financial regime. International financial and political institutions that act as the main regulators of global affairs reflect Western norms and values, mainly neoliberal set of norms and values. And this West-centric domination and reflection of Western interests is not so surprising as the system is established by the victors of the Second World War. The system now faces legitimacy crisis as it's evident that the current structure is inadequate in addressing the complex issues of 21st century, <coughs> varying from poverty to security, from ecological crisis to financial ones. In other words, global problems that require immediate and effective global solutions. The legitimacy crisis becomes more and more evident with the 2008 financial crisis. And with regards to the gloomy picture I just presented you, the literature and we had our high expectations with the BRICS. So uh, I want to move on to BRICS and African discourse a bit. So within the, uh, with the inclusion of South Africa in 2010, this BRICS activity on development framework to empower Africa and eliminate poverty gain momentum. Uh, it was an unexpected expansion as South Africa was not showing a rapid growth as the remaining uh, nations in the forum. This expansion was regarded as a result of the coalition uh, to expand their policy areas on global politics as well as an attempt to legitimize its development and multilateral, multipolar discourse as well as the African agenda that has South-oriented discursive characteristics. Uh, in their summits, uh, BRICS stressed the importance of the involvement in the uh, current African development framework led by the UN to enhance the outcomes of the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, especially in the African continent. Uh, as you can see from the slides, their commitment to African development is specifically referred in the fifth summit of the BRICS and under the theme of Africa and BRICS, Partnership for Development, Integration and Industrialization. Well, uh, throughout our research, actually, we wanted to focus more on the comparison between the West uh, discourse of the uh, African agenda and the BRICS discourse. In that way, actually, we thought that it's better to uh, show or present the differences or similarities between them. So it will be quite beneficial to present the discourse and reality of the West first, then I will move on with the BRICS discourse in BRICS reality for African and uh, BRICS cooperation. Well, as just briefly Jones referred, we wanted to introduce a compar comparative element to our study, so we decided to explore the current development framework. But before doing that, I would like to discuss what development is. Although there are various conceptions of development, the dominant conception of development is influenced by neoliberal values and norms, and this economic conception of development basically entails that development is equal to economic growth. In African regions with pre-industrialized economies, this notion of development is seen in the form of post-colonial state-led development with implementation of neoliberal market principles through intense state regulations to promote trade-induced economic growth and hence development. And to move on with the current development framework, 
Poverty prevailing in the least developed regions of the world is seen as the main obstacle in promoting development. And to deal with the issue, global partner to partnership to eradicate extreme poverty and empower the least development least developed regions was initiated in Millennium Summit in 2000. The summit initiated the United Nations-led development framework with the collaborations of international financial institutions, namely the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. And the current development framework is implemented through Millennium Development Goals, a set of goals to eradicate extreme poverty, especially in the least developed regions. The project is a 15-year-old project initiated in the summit and will come to an end by the end of 2015. And when we examine the latest uh, progress chart, we see, for insta instance, that apart from the six goals dealing with HIV AIDS, all goals are far from reaching the target in sub-Saharan African region, the region we examined within our case study. And when we examine the chart, we see that the picture remains the same for the, for the remaining regions. As the project is very close to its deadline, it's safe to say that the project overall is far from reaching its moderate target. And I emphasize moderate as these far targets fail to grasp the historical and structural reasons behind extreme poverty, especially prevailing in the least developed post-colonial nations. And uh, as a complementary to the MDG project, Human Development Index is a crucial element of this supposed human rights-based approach to development. And it was really influential for our project and we examined these reports to see if the economic growth was actually translating into human development and or not. The HDI is a composite statistic of life expectancy, education, and per capita income indicators. By using these indicators, the index ranks countries into four tiers of human, the human development called very high human development, high human development, medium human development, and low human development. Before 2010, the index was only based on GDP per capita as its only indicator, which tends to illustrate income. After 2010, by taking the shortcomings of this income metric approach into account, the index incorporated health and education indicators to reflect human development. These metrics are problematic as it fails to capture the essence of extreme poverty. Even though there are attempts to reflect in inequality, by only taking into account these metrics that fails to grasp, grasp the underlying reasons of inequalities among and within nations is problematic. And the lack of reliable data or data at all is another problem for the approach and it was a huge problem when we were trying to conduct our case study. Before we uh, talk about our case study, I just want to present you the BRICS African Agenda in reality. So uh, there are three uh, major trends as you can see here, which is trade, foreign direct, direct investment and development assistance. Although uh, each BRIC nation has attempt to engage with Africa with these uh, activities, uh, they have particular interest and they have structural dynamics and this actually induces divergent cooperation activities. For example, why Brazil and Russia are seen as a small trading partners, China encompasses all the fields. Well, starting with the trade, uh, the chart is showing which uh, uh, the BRICs export to the Africa and which country exports what the most to the Africa. The BRICS countries combined 24% uh, of the total exports to Africa, which is the second trade, trade, uh, trading partner with Africa. Uh, the value of BRICS nations, uh, BRICS trade was estimated 16% of the global world trade, so it is really huge potential, you can say. And the Africa's uh, exports to the BRICS is about 117 billion, and half of those went to China and quarter to Africa, uh, India. Uh, this slide, as you can see, the BRICS exports to Africa, we can say that the main product exported to the Africa is manufactured goods. Uh, it is exported by China with 67%. Then India follows it with fuel. Russia follows it with food. Brazil exported the highest share of food products, which is 47%. And South Africa actually uh, exports primary commodities and fuel. But what South Africa did in this uh, engagement with Africa is that improving the infrastructure so that BRICS nations can invest them and aid them and trading with them. So uh, you can see the uh, African exports to the BRICS here. So let's move on with the foreign direct investment. 
As you can see here, there is an increase in FDI flow to Africa from the BRICS, and recent data shows that the flow of uh, FDI rise from 18% to 21% between 1999 and 2008. China is the main trading part, uh, FDI partner here with $4.3 billion. And uh, the FDI flow from China goes to 23 African least developed countries. Lastly, talk, let's talk about the aid for a bit. So, uh, the China's engagement with Africa consists of the infrastructure financing, mainly in Sudan and Nigeria, because these regions has the rich oil resources. So we can say that this is uh, this uh, engagement largely driven by the China's objective of securing the access of oil and mineral. And nearly 70% uh, of the infrastructure financing in Africa is concentrated in these, those regions, uh, plus Angola, Ethiopia. We can say uh, India and Russia has uh, uh, provide technical uh, and food assistance to the region, but they are actually remain passive compared to China. Brazil uh, actually provides employment for several regions, but it is problematic because in terms of providing an empowering framework of the development, since the labor force consists of the Brazilian workers, the unemployment rate is still high for those regions. So, uh, throughout our research, we use HDI reports, IMF and World Bank reports as our key data. And these development indicators uh, showed us how the discourse of the BRICS and those numbers of the FDI and aid uh, remains inadequate in terms of developing these nations. We use uh, Sudan and Nigeria as our case studies because BRICS nations invest heavily in those regions. And we focus most on the uh, HDI reports from 2008 to 2014 because the activity seen the most between those periods. But uh, actually there is a problem here. I mean, in contrast to positive indicators, there are uh, still some issues in terms of human poverty index and there is a power to get between rich and poor. Also, there is a diminished performance of the trade due to the import and ex export imbalances. Also, there is no data for the uh, expenditure on education within public and private expenditures, so it is problematic for us during the data collection process. Um, you can see from this slide that there is a growth for those countries, but actually this growth is trade-induced growth. So here, this slide, you can see that both Nigeria and Sudan remain low uh, in the Human Development Index. Because uh, the reason for that is the trade-induced development cannot be translated to the social development. And actually, we think that this is the main problem for the current uh, development framework. The development framework for the West in global governance is focused on the GDP growth, the economic uh, development. However, there is social development which cannot uh, translate with uh, economic uh, growth. So... Uh, the responsible factor is the system, as we said, and we think that BRICS countries still operating in the system, still following the path of the core nations, still engaging with this current neoliberal framework. So as they continue to do this, their agenda won't be different than the West for Africa, and those countries will actually remain below the human development average. So far, we tried to illustrate our findings. Now we will try to introduce our analysis of all these findings. And by doing so, we made use of Wallerstein's world system theory. In 1974, rather than understanding the global order through state-centric perspective, Immanuel Wallerstein offered world systems theory, which proposes that the world is not divided into states, but rather to the inter interdependent regions of core, semi-periphery and periphery. Market plays a dominant role in this division of labor. A structure of the current world system is a power hierarchy between the core and the periphery, in which powerful, wealthy core societies dominate and exploit weak and poor peripheral societies. And in that sense, semi-periphery so, semi that acts loyal to the core uh, helps the core to exploit the periphery. With regard to the world system theory and to our findings on the African agenda of the BRICS, final questions we explored to, to offer our analysis on 
breaks with a global power hierarchy, and the implications of all these findings were the following. Can the rising influence of the BRICS, as well as their global agenda and their agenda on African development, be regarded as the rise of the periphery, or rather an attempt to settle, settle for the semi-periphery? And finally, is the African agenda of the BRICS, compared to the current development agenda, create sustainable African futures, as they argue, or is this just another scramble for Africa? The dark side was tempting. Despite all the cookies, we had our hopes with the BRICS as a form of emerging economy with promising political intentions and a comprehensive African agenda that promised sustainable African futures. They seemed and certainly do have the potential to reform the global governance structure. However, the reality of their African agenda seems not to be so different from the United Nations-led agenda that opts for trade-induced economic growth that doesn't really translate into social human development. And throughout our research, we sadly found out that BRICS were reluctant to use their reforming potential on various occasions, including the security debates at the United Nations. All these imply that the BRICS are not so dissatisfied with the system itself, but with their share in the system. And their African agenda is indeed a new scramble for Africa to enhance their position in global power hierarchy. To conclude, the rise of the BRICS is not the rise of a peripheral power. Their African agenda can produce growth figures, yet, yet it fails to create sustainable African futures. And in reality, it is a scramble to elevate their status by following the colonial footsteps of their Western counterparts. That was the story how we joined the dark side. Thank you for listening to us. We will be pleased to listen, answer all your questions. And after that, hopefully, we will try to briefly discuss the GE courses and show you how we've been there, done that, and got the scars. So a rather pessimistic analysis. <laughs> But a, uh, an analysis all the same, that's the point, that uh, uh, you cannot force your facts. As a researcher, you must focus on uh, what, the, what the information says, what the data says, and then you draw your conclusions from that. It's an important part, of, an important part of, of this course. Okay, so we, as I said, we have a few minutes for some questions, and then they want to talk about the uh, transdisciplinary yes. senior project as well. So anyone with a burning question to start us off? Anyone want to start the questioning off? Either about the project, about their methods, about their data. I know their teachers are eager to ask questions, but let's give a few. Okay, Matt, good. Well, uh, while we searched the engagement for those countries, actually we didn't see any engagements with social activities in uh, Africa for those regions. Actually, South Africa, as a part of this coalition, was responsible for the social development and both economic and social development. But this development, actually, they assumed that need to do done in that way because they wanted to trade and. Uh, they wanted to continue this FDI and uh, development assistance uh, activities. I mean, for us and for me, actually, they actually a bit isolate that type of uh, understanding of development. They focus on the economic development. The coalition, the nations themselves focused on that type of development. So, actually, I don't have any clear answer to your question, but if the system works in that way, they will remain below the average Maybe for the human I development. Can be a bit more <laughs> Well, if we're talking about the BRICS coalition, the uh, BRICS coalition does have this intellectual forum uh, that uh, produces yearly reports and academic papers that offers them guidance on how to improve the social conditions of these countries and how to elevate their agendas uh, in terms of the, either on development or their other uh, agendas, say, on security. 
And all these papers, we made highly use of them while we were conducting our research. And that is a good part. You should always, always, always read. You will never know when you can find a good data or a good advice on anywhere. So try to read everything. And <coughs> while we were reading those, there were really good fund findings and really good recommendations for the BRICS coalition to, to efficiently address your question. But the thing is, BRICS doesn't really take these findings and these academic reports into account. If they actually take these into account and actually implement their original discourse, they, then this problem might be addressed and there might be social elements within their development framework. But even though their discourse looks bright and shiny, they choose to follow the footsteps of the Western. So first they need to change their agenda. First they need to stick with their original discourse and act according to it and take these recommendations into account. Not sure if that was really helpful uh, to your question, but that is my account of the issue, at least. Thank you. For the case study for data part, we didn't really use that because there were, as we referred to it before, we had the problem of finding reliable data. The problem is in these regions, there is either no data at all or the data are so beyond measures that we, we can't really trust these data. So we stick with the World Bank data, the International Monetary Fund data, and the uh, data is used by other academic forms. But we made use of the library in, while we were uh, at the initial steps of our research when we were focusing on the, uh, the countries within the BRICS coalition to see what they are doing in terms of their interna internal structures, in, in terms of their political assemblies and their economic structure. So we made use of the books in the library, but we didn't really use the database. Well, Well, the thing was first, uh, it's I think for at least for our study, it was crucial to have a decent timeline, since the development framework, both for current one for the and for the BRICS, it initially started in 2000, and we tried to have this time frame within 2000 and 2015. And we had, we divided into two periods, from 2000 to 2008 and from 2008 to 2015. That was the first step, because once we had our timeline, everything was a bit more clear. Then we decided, we used uh, human development index reports. World Bank, we made use of the World Bank database. You can check it, you can, uh, once you log in, they have this, I don't know, rather not so confusing database, it's really user friendly. Once you log in, you can create your own data. You can choose countries, years, and all the indicators you want, and there are numerous indicators that you can use. The World Bank was really helpful in that sense. We used their quantitative data. And as I said, you can never know where you can find data. So we tried to read everything we can find on Sudan and Nigeria. And the, the involvements within the BRICS countries and within the UN, UN framework. So we made use of numerous papers, like we were reading, I don't know, 
things about the internal situations of Sudan and Nigeria and then there was this data on the paper and we checked the source, we traced it back and we found an amazing database over there. So try to read a lot. You can never know where you can find data. That was, that was the initial thing we learned during our case study period. So first have your timetable, then check various databases and World Bank is a good, they has a rather good database. So try to make use of that one. I hope that was, I don't know, explanatory enough. Arkadaşlar G'yi için soru sormak isteyenler kalabilirler. <gülüyor>